Mohandas Gandhi, who enjoyed being called Mahatma, which means great soul, positively hated sex. Though he married at age 13, and sired five children, he told his followers, Take gift from me that there is no happiness in marriage. I cannot imagine a thing as ugly as the intercourse of a man and woman. That it leads to the birth of children is due to God's inscrutable way. I refuse to believe that the sensual affinity referred to here can at all be regarded as natural. No, I must declare with all the power I can command that sensual attraction even between my husband and wife is unnatural. Sex outside the marriage was of course unthinkable. Even within marriage, though, Great Soul taught that either partner could and should break the original contract at will. In my opinion husband and wife do not have to obtain each other's consent for practicing chastity. Mutual consent is essential for intercourse, but no consent is necessary for abstention. And so Great Soul himself informed his wife one day, that her sex life was over, and that was that. Ever the realist, Great Soul did not seek to live in the last generation of Indians. Procreation ought to be looked upon as duty and sexual union resorted to for that purpose only. Apart from this they should never engage in the sex act. Nor should they allow themselves privacy. If a man controls his semen except on the occasion of such purposeful cohabitation he is as good as an avowed celibate. Furthermore, Great Soul wrote, In this world, the violation of chastity is the root cause and only source of evils such as a passion for pleasure, envy, ostentation, hypocrisy, anger, impatience, and violent hatred. If one's mind is not under control indulging oneself once every day or more, what other crimes would one not commit, knowingly or unknowingly? What unforgivable sins would one stop short of? One thing Great Soul did like, was cuddling naked with teenage girls. The idea, he explained to his critics, was to condition himself to an absence of desire even in the most trying of circumstances. He insisted that, if he could achieve that, the resulting burst of holiness energy would be powerful enough to flee into your British rule. Make of that what you will, at any rate, I should also note that Gandhi wrote to a relative to acknowledge the birth of a daughter. If I say it is good, it would be a lie. If I express sorrow, it would be violence. According to my present ideas, I should remain indifferent. Meanwhile I would only say and wish that you learn to control your senses in the right manner. The fact that a rather large body of Hindu sacred literature expressed an entirely different view of sex did not face great soul. Nor was his asceticism limited to sex, it even covered things like modern medicine, another great evil. He allowed his wife to die rather than let her have a shot of penicillin. How could she be sick, after all, when Gandhi himself had written about the great health benefits of celibacy? But celibacy was not Gandhi's only contribution to modern medicine. Another practice he promoted was called Ramanama which consisted of repeating the name of the god Rama over and over, for hours of end. According to Dr. Gandhi, this produces a state in which one will have reduced oneself to a cipher. Such a person, who lives constantly in the sight of God, will every moment feel Rama dwelling in his heart. Gandhi wrote extensively about Ramanama, insisting that it produced peace of mind, mental equilibrium, and composure. It also contributed to chastity, by cleansing the mind of impure thoughts. No need for psychiatrists, according to Gandhi. Ramanama is an invaluable remedy for mental illness. A sovereign remedy for all our ailments. A most powerful remedy with miraculous powers. Truly a panacea for all our ills. When Ramanama holds sway, all illness vanishes. Ramanama is the unfailing remedy for eradicating malaria. Rather than, say, Iwanin. Oh, right western medicine, the great evil, never mind then. All illness is the result of the violation of the laws of nature, in other words, the penalty of the sin against him, that is, God, since he and his laws are one. The rationale Gandhi gave for Ramanama was thus borrowed from Middle Ages Christianity. After all, the 16th century Pope Pius V had ordered that before administering treatment, all physicians should call in a physician of the soul, in other words a priest, because bodily infirmity frequently arises from sin. Where there is absolute purity, inner and outer, illness becomes impossible. If one is knowingly filled with the presence of God within, one is that moment free from all ailments, physical, mental or moral. Disease is impossible where there is purity of thought. Conscious belief in God and the knowledge of his law make perfect cure possible without any further aid. As Gandhi further explained in a 1946 article entitled Nature Cure Treatment. Nature Cure Treatment means the treatment which befits man both mind and soul. 
For such a being, Ramanama is the truest nature cure treatment. It is unfailing remedy. No matter what the ailment. Recitation of Ramanama from the heart is the sure cure. Long before the onslaught of medical malpractice cases, Gandhi sought to cover his exposure, however. If in spite of this, death supervenes we may not mind. On the contrary, it should be welcomed. Science has not so far discovered any recipe for making the body immortal. Immortality is an attribute of the soul. Reality sometimes has a way of intruding on the most finely honed theology, though. Gandhi's teenage great-niece, Manu, who shared his bed, was chronically ill with intestinal problems. There was no need to see a doctor, though, said Gandhi. She will not have frequent bouts of fever if she had Ramanama firmly enshrined in her heart. Still I am convinced that if only she has Ramanama inscribed in her heart, she will suffer no physical enfeeblement. Hearing death, Manu was finally rushed to a hospital, where her life was saved by an emergency appendectomy. Gandhi was mortified, not because he realized that his own deadness had nearly killed his great niece, but because of the incontrovertible evidence of his inadequate holiness. He later told Menno, Though I have no longer the desire to live for 125 years as I have said again and again of late, my striving to meet death unafraid with Raman Amal on my lips continues. I know my striving is incomplete. Your operation is a proof. Where did Gandhi get these bizarre ideas? They did not come from careful study of the vast body of Hindu literature. There were a few Hindu texts that Gandhi quoted frequently but others he seems never to have read at all. Instead he claimed he dealt directly with God, who instructed Gandhi by means of what Gandhi called the voice. In 1933 the voice told him to launch a 21-day fast. Indians demanded to know more about this voice. Gandhi replied, What is it? What did I hear? Was there any person I saw? If not, how was the voice conveyed to me? These are pertinent questions. For me the voice of God, of conscience, of truth or the inner voice, or the still small voice mean one and the same thing. I saw no form. I have never tried, for I always believed God to be without form. It was like a voice from afar yet quite near. It was unmistakable as some human voice definitely speaking to me and irresistible. I was not dreaming at the time I heard the voice. The hearing of the voice was preceded by a terrific struggle within me. Suddenly the voice came upon me. I listened, made certain it was the voice, and the struggle ceased. I was calm, not the unanimous verdict of the whole world against me could shake me from the belief that what I heard was the true voice of God. In fairness, the voice sometimes told Gandhi to do positive things. The manifestation that told him to go on the hunger strike was intended as a strike against mistreatment of the UN Touchables caste, which Gandhi called a great Satanism, a hydra-headed monster, a canker eating at the vitals of Hinduism and an unmitigated curse. Although he regarded the Hindu caste system in general as invested with religious meaning, he fought tirelessly against the degradation of the untouchables and shocked orthodox Hindus by expressing a desire to be reincarnated as an untouchable. He even asserted that the devastating Bihar earthquake of 1934 resulted from God's anger over untouchability, not unlike the Reverend John Haji blaming Hurricane Catherine on the sinfulness of New Orleans or Pat Roberts and blaming the 2010 Haiti earthquake on an alleged ancient pact between Haitians and the devil. The problem with accepting leadership from one who relies on the voice, rather than common sense and experiences, that you can never predict what the voice is going to say. Allowing religion to play such a large part in India's independence movement produced tragic results, and made the division of India and Pakistan virtually inevitable. This text is excerpted and adapted from the article The Grinch Who Stole Valentine's Day by Louis Granados, a Washington, D.C. attorney and student of religious history. It appeared in the February-March 2010 issue of Free Inquiry magazine.